According to SAMHSA's National Survey on Drug Use and Health, approximately 20.3 million people above the age 12 suffer from substance use disorder. Incredible. The disease of addiction takes an average of 130 Americans every day. Sadly, the opioid crisis, which many consider the worst pandemic of our time, has been even further perpetuated by the spread of COVID-19. Since the start of the coronavirus outbreak, drug overdoses have increased by 18%. Factors like economic stress and social isolation have led to increased depression and unnecessary deaths. A Better Life Recovery is a premier addiction treatment center in Southern California, offering one of the most highly regarded and comprehensive addiction treatment programs in the United States. Dedicated to helping its clients achieve complete inner and outer transformation, they offer a 45 to 90 day program custom tailored to meet the needs of each individual client. Long term is the way to go. Many of A Better Life's clients elect to stay up to nine months to receive additional support. A Better Life Recovery will do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to ensure the success of every client. Are you ready for a better life? Go to abetterliferecovery.com or call 866-581-4401 now. Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. Drew. Here we are. I see you all uh, in the thread. Uh, I'm not seeing any. Strangely, I've got a frozen screen up there. So oh, you, you do? Yeah. Oh, I, I thought you were talking about online. No, I don't know if it means anything, but uh, all I have is the banner up there. Um, so, uh, Casey Gates Cat. Hmm. Did you show something, Casey? Ivy World. Patrick, how are you guys? Uh, hi. Hi, uh, GSR. Uh, Ashley. So, um, we're going to talk, of course, uh, it's a great uh, Anthony Brown. In just what do you see here. now? Uh, just plain blue. Same thing okay. used to be behind I'm gonna me. click it again and okay. see if it picks up. Uh, and I understand the president is speaking right now, and it's getting everybody all upset. Oh, no, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, bad timing. I'm staying out of it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Dr. I mean, Anthony Brown and I will talk a little bit about mental illness and those okay. things. There we go. Now it's, now it's all up. Uh, but we thank you for being here today and for avoiding the chaos of the elections. My my general mental health. Um, what is he saying? I, I don't know. Bert DeBrow just texted me like, ah, I can't believe it. I'm like, I, what I don't is he hear saying? It. He's going to win. I don't still? know. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> okay, I'll watch and find out. I don't want to know. I, I'm oh, staying out on, of it. Drew. I don't want to know. I want I know, to be you're out so of bad. it. I'm like apolitical, but for right. some reason, I'm riveted to this crap. Oh my! It's just the, the show. <laughs> Give them the old razzle dazzle. Well, I'm interested to know how it's going. You know, it's just so well. Good, you're gonna but, update but me. But be more. Go, go watch the reruns later, everybody. Stay here for the show. Right, right. So, um, what I'm gonna do? We're gonna talk to Anthony Brown about homelessness, about mental health issues. Uh, is Anthony our only guest today, Susan? Is yes, sir. Okay, so we're gonna, we're, we're, I've got some interesting COVID stuff to go over with everybody a little bit later. Uh, thank all of you who kept telling me to watch the Dr. John Campbell uh, videos. I finally got to them. I'd had it on my computer for a while and never got a chance to sit down and watch them. Really well done. Nice, clear, well thought out, great scientist, good good, good thinking. Uh, so thank you for that. It really helped me to, to he, he, he uh, calmed some of my concerns actually, interestingly. So we'll have a chance for your questions in just a minute, but right now I want to bring in the one and only Anthony Brown. Anthony's book, of course, is From Park Bench to Park Avenue. I suggest you read it. Uh, Anthony and I are working on a number of different things, and currently he is a director of nursing for, what's the name of the facility? Extended Care Hospital of Westminster. Westminster Extended Care Hospital, which is, to me, so you're, it's a residential psychiatric hospital, essentially, yes? Yes. Do you have locked beds, too, or n nothing Yeah, acute? we're all locked. The whole place is locked. He's wow. also an author. Park Bench to Park Avenue, as I mentioned a couple times. Okay, so I just want to show the book. There it is, and I suggest you read it. It's uh, it's how it is the best insight into both the disease of addiction and the problems of homelessness. Uh, I, I think it's because it's from the perspective of the lived encounter and also now somebody who's a high-caliber high professional. So he has a, a way of looking at these things that are clear and accurate and um, undistorted. So, Anthony, let me start first with um, what trends you're seeing in mental health and hospitalized mental health. And what, what's, uh, without leading the witness, tell me just what comes to mind when you think about what you're seeing out there. Um, mental health, um, basically, everything is status quo still. You know, um, <clears throat> right now, <clears throat> excuse me, right now because of COVID, People are um, 
getting off conservatorship a lot easier. And that um, gives people back their, their right, their autonomy. And the first thing they want to do is have their freedom, which is fine and dandy. But a lot of them leave before they get the adequate skills necessary to be able to stay out of the hospital. Uh, and that, but they're leaving your facility before they get the vocational rehab and the psych education, that kind of stuff, right? Right. Because, Why? Right. Why? Because it's freedom. Because they want to. Yeah, they, <laughs> because want, they to. want to. Okay, got it. Oh, boy. Yeah, boy. And they just go to the streets, I imagine. Um, a lot of them, you know, we we can't just release people to the street. You get sent off into some step-down unit, whether it's boarding care or room and board or something. But the problem is, once they leave us, there's no, there's no follow-up. There's no continuity of care. Are, are most of them willing to take meds as they go out the door? Uh, yes, a lot of them leave with the um, with the mindset that they that they want to do right. All but, right, um, that's nice. A lot of them, huh? yeah. <laughs> but some of them run into snags. I know. Um, recently, I ran into an individual not from my hospital, but just out in the streets, and he called me several times saying, "Well, I'm having problems. You know, I can't focus." But he never said that he was on medication. Right. Right. And then finally, you know, he admitted, "I'm on medication, but I can't get a refill." Right. And and, and so we. And by the way. I, I, as soon as an ad, is he an addict or history of addiction? I mean, he has history of addiction. Yeah. All right. So I, immediately when I hear that, of course, I know that's a play for Adderall uh, or some sort of psychostimulant, <clears throat> and it, it means I I don't meth is making me psychotic. I need a different psychostimulant. That's usually what it means. So I, I don't know, but and, and but be that as it may, I don't know the case. It's just been my experience. Uh, what what's coming in the door? What's getting people into the hospital? What what kind of serious mental illness sort of is there any trends in that? Is it all addiction? Is it more schizophrenia, bipolar? What are you seeing? Um, we're we're seeing more. Um, we're primarily mental health, so we're going to get yeah. you know the overall diagnosis as being that uh, mostly the schizo schizophrenia, schizoaffective uh, things of that nature. Um, a lot of people are managing a lot better with some of the other stuff. I mean, of course, you know, personality disorders, are, there's not much you can do with individuals like that. Yeah. Yes and no. I, 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 there's nothing we're allowed to do in a formal sense. In other words, there's nothing that insurance companies or the state will pay for, but dialectical behavioral therapies work, uh, vocational rehabs work, uh, you know, the stuff that works, it helps these people. We're just, we don't have the resources to give it to them, but I, it, that's a that's a granular issue that I worry about if we solve some of the upfront problems. But that, that's that's if, we, if we're at the point where we're talking about helping that, that would be nice, frankly. Um, okay, and, and is is family involvement? Do you see much family involvement in the care? Concerns from family who can't you know get their hands around the the, the loved one? I, I see some family involvement, not. I would say probably maybe 25% um, uh, families do get involved. Um, some families feel helpless. And that's a that's another one of my tangents I go off on is, why can't we have a system that if the individual's in the hospital, why can't we provide family services maybe in the home? So when they transition back, they have that continuity of care. Well, not only that, there's a bigger problem in there. And let me answer Stephen Z's question. Is schizophrenia hereditary? Serious mental illness is hereditary. It tends to be a higher incidence in families that have a history of serious mental illness. That it, it, it tends to, you can't say it's schizophrenia necessarily, but serious mental illness tends to, tends to show up in family systems. Addiction, definitely hereditary. But one of the problems I see, here's, here's a law we could change right away. Treat the psychiatric medical record exactly like the medical record in acute care hospital. Guess what? When somebody is on a ventilator and we're trying to make decisions, we don't go, I can't tell you whether this patient's a patient at this hospital. To the family. Can you imagine that? We are, and we also don't go, I'm sorry, I can't tell you what's going on with the patient because he didn't give me written permission before I had to put him on a ventilator. You talk to the family and you make decisions. You have a durable power of attorney for health care. We need a durable power of attorney for psychiatric health care, and we need a dur durable a, a directive to physicians for psychiatric care just the way we do with medical care. And we should be just as free to talk to families and anybody else as we would. Just the HIPAA, HIPAA is enough, just basic HIPAA standards. You know what I'm talking about? Right, right. Yeah. But you're gonna, you're gonna, of course, you're gonna have patients' rights advocates and, you know, everything else rising up to the cage and saying, well, you know, this individual does have a right, 
which which I agree, they do have a right. But if you are unable to make certain decisions, then not that your rights should be curved, but it should be. Um, Anthony, know, here's my here's my here's my response to those idiots, which is, you're causing stigma. You're out there saying these that we have to reduce stigma. And guess what? When you treat mental illnesses any different than medical illnesses, you're contributing to stigma. Stop it. Stop with the stigmatizing. Treat m things in the skull the same as we treat in the chest or in the stomach. Same. No different. Period. End of story. And and I, I'm really I'm furious about that one. So that's one thing you and I would agree, right? We could, that, That'd be a positive change, yes? Yes, absolutely. We can right. agree on that one. All right. <laughs> we, we, I wanted. I told Anthony I want to talk about things we could do, sort of root 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 cause stuff that we could sort of point at, so people can understand what what things could be done to help homeless and seriously mentally ill. Um, the, Which has the, been put on the back burner for a few months. Well, we've been busy with COVID and elections and all this other nonsense. So yeah, and everything but mental health problems. Uh, Casey Gates, that's a terrible story to hear. I may have to have you on the th on the thread here to tell us the story sometime. He was misdiagnosed um, inpatient as bipolar, got 10 years to get re-diagnosed, was on antipsychotics, got worse. Yeah, there is a lot of um, not high-quality psychiatric care going on generally in the country, and part of that is the system. Part of it is not enough psychiatrists. Part of it is not enough... Uh, resources and part of it is um, that's just the way medical systems are they make mistakes you know that's the way it is uh, not that I'm saying it's okay I'm just saying that's the, the explanation so I I heard uh, from one of the people I've, I don't want to get into specifics about this but one of the people you and I have been talking to about doing stuff to help with the homelessness um, that a gigantic sum of money was um, granted to some organization that's setting up an institution I don't want to point fingers because God bless them for being wanting to help at all. Um, but their their stated goal is to <laughs> understand homelessness as strictly a manifestation of systemic racism. And therefore, if you cure, if you correct the racism, you end the homelessness. Now, I'm certain that, that racism figures into our problem with homelessness Go to downtown Los Angeles. Tell me that the policies aren't racist. Tell me. But I don't know the racist the racism is causing the policies. You know what I mean, Anthony? Right, right. I, I you know, there there is racism out there, there's no doubt about it. But does, of course. does racism cause homelessness? Well, I don't know. I think it would be more on um people just or people are confused and baffled and don't exactly know how to address it because homelessness is a four-part thing you know it has to do with absence of a roof over your head it has to do with mental illness substance abuse and it has to do with financial all four of those things have to be looked at at once and when you just isolate it you go okay well it's racism then what are you going to do just focus on the individuals of color and not the rest of the people that's out there or, 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 or I, I, and I don't, I don't see a road to helping. If I, if I saw a road to helping with that, I would advocate. But I don't know how it helps, except, except if they're truly honest and they really want to um, look at the the racist piece, look at the outcome and then dial it back. So clearly, the outcome is racist. Let's go back to what got the people on the street. And and to me that if we get them to do that we may we may come up all in the same place because it gets pretty obvious when you go start going to root causes don't you think? Right, right. But I think um, that would it, it's just adding another element on top of what's already there. That's true. That's true. You know, and so so it might blur it a little bit. So what would so I've already heard you concerned about the conservatorships being. Um, less stringent uh, if conservatorships would be a little stickier and a little easier to get we both think that would be helpful what else do you think would be helpful and from a I, what well, i'll let I won't, again i won't lead the witness what else comes to mind for you uh, when it comes to dealing with the homeless population mm -hmm. i think um we, we have to create a way of helping people regrowth their self-esteem all right, you've, you've mentioned that to me before a few times. Let's, let's kind of drill into that a little bit. Because 
because self-esteem is in fact something that's and and I I don't want to be lecturing you. You're you're an expert in this area too, but I'm I'm stating it out loud so other people watching come along with us. That self-esteem is sort of set by the age of five, but that's esteem per se. And people either have sort of a high or low. And I I have low, but low self-esteem motivates me to do a better job. And I can certainly find things to do in the world that make me feel good about myself inside of my basic posture of low self-esteem. So I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the ability to feel engaged and good as a, as a person, as somebody who's able to engage in the world, right? I, I think, um, I, I feel that you can learn or self-esteem in itself is learned by doing certain types of acts. And if you can... Because I know, I know, I can speak for myself personal, personally. Whenever I felt low self esteem, I had low self worth, and so I had okay. no so so no drive. Lo, see, see, I think we're I think we're talking about different things. That's why I wanted to talk about this. I low self worth. I I agree with you. Maybe we ought to have a, instead of an esteem movement, we ought to have a worth movement. You know, a worthiness movement or something. You know what I mean? Because worthiness right. is something that's kind of manifest in the world. You 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 build your self worth. Or you at least it it's supported by what you do in the world and how you feel about yourself engaged with other people. Yeah. Okay. Well, we we can approach it at that angle. Yeah. But never nevertheless, how do we get someone who doesn't feel good about themselves and don't know how to create something that's long lasting so that they may look at things different and continue to move forward and feel good about what they're doing? You know, I'm just thinking about some of the cases I've dealt with. A lot of them have very high self-esteem, and that's kind of what I'm fighting. Their their engagement in the world doesn't fit with their self-esteem, so they don't really come fully to terms with what has happened to them. And so I think the first order of business is taking taking an account of your life and ownership of it. I guess, you know, accepting reality and reality's terms and then deciding where you'd like to go, right? Is this okay? Let's get realistic, and maybe let's make let's sort of talk about how to be. And and people, and I've noticed this with millennials especially, they don't like to make those small steps. You talk about that because that was something you were able to do, like like no one. You, you you're continuing to do it every day, as far as I know. How did you? How did you? Well, the moments of change are sort of magical, but once you've made that moment of change, how did you? have the patience to do all that incremental improvement? Well, it's things happen in layers. And once I was able to accomplish one small thing, I felt good about myself. And I felt confident about myself. So I took that next step, even if it was a risk, knowing that I have accomplished things before. And even, even where I'm at in life right now, and I think about this a lot, um, being able to, to chat it up with you, that that totally blows myself worries to my self-confidence out the water <laughs> good all right <laughs> you know, i like that and, that's and, good and it's true you know and then being able to feel that much secure within myself i'm able to go forth and present different programs to different hospitals knowing that i have enough confidence to be able to do this yeah and so i i get all of that just from being around people or presenting myself or learning how to present myself in a way in which other people help support what I'm doing. Yeah, I get it. I get it. And, and so, so you, you know, uh, in dealing with addicts all the time, you know, we're always telling them early in their illness, be right sized. Be right sized. You know, be. be you're, you're not a record producer. You're a, you're maybe a musician. Maybe a good musician. Even but you're a crack addict or you're an alcoholic. That's you got to be right sized to that. And then we'll we can build our way back to director of nursing like yourself or to the record producer, whatever it is, but you don't get to jump there. You have to first be right-sized. And sometimes that means washing dishes. Sometimes that just means getting coffee in a meeting. It's, it's keeping it simple. Keeping it simple, I guess, is kind of the way. And, and then real worth develops in those small little moments like you're describing, Anthony. Okay, so we, sh we, sh we should write a, I don't know, a little thing on this. So the worthiness thing is... As I, I think we're talking about worthiness and not esteem, and, and we should make a distinction. We should we should drill into that some more, and maybe offline somewhere. All right, anything else uh, that we could go at root cause wise homelessness? Um, I, I think um, people 
I believe in education. Education. And, yeah, yeah. And education and vocation. You know, if someone, if, if we can figure out, because I, I hear a lot of good ideas out there, which, which are band-aids. I mean, it's just recycled stuff. Yeah. And if they can factor into allowing somebody or helping them find education, because there's a lot of education out there for, you know, the formerly incarcerated individuals and things like that, that a lot of people don't even know about. So, so maybe, yeah, maybe a more unified system. So less, less of a, you know, less of a Rorschach experience when you go to the system. Um, the, I, I was thinking about a phone call I took about five years ago from this kid that called in. He'd, he'd made his way off the streets. He, he had sort of a decompensation of some type psychiatrically and he couldn't get worried. Anyway, he completely ended up on the streets and he, he made his way back. And he said, you know, I know exactly what we need to do. I know exactly how to fix homelessness. This is exactly what helped me. You need a place and you need to have, you know, a bed and meals and four walls. And in that place, you need to have, well, doctors and nurses and social workers and vocational rehab specialists. And I said, I said, yeah, yeah, that's a psychiatric hospital. Anthony, <laughs> that's where Anthony works. That's that's what that is. Let's not mince words anymore. Let's call it what it is. That's a psychiatric residential facility. And yes, we need tons of those. We absolutely do. So would you agree that building more of those sorts of facilities would be helpful? Well, I don't know being helpful. It's, it's a start. What we need is to be able to allow individuals to integrate back into the community and have support as they deal with different levels in the community. I was just um, working with somebody the other day, just got out of jail, just on probation, medication barely getting stabilized because they sleep three days in a row. And they, they want to, they tell me, I want to be like you. Well, this is 20 years in the making. Right, right, right. You know, and how about you start small? Right. And because of the medications just being worked out and because of the, um, criminal history it's hard to go get a job right well so there's I, another but there's another thing we can improve in terms of how we treat felons in the employment realm yes yeah oh absolutely Part particularly drug addicts particularly right, drug right. addicts yeah yeah so it's, it's it's a broader problem than just say okay well here's a roof over your head good luck did i send you the encyclical this giant document that uh, robert marbert put together from the federal government um, I don't think so, but I'll be more than happy to. Oh my God, it, it. it's it it's complete, man. It is. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. It it is really intense, uh, and it's it's a very high quality document. There it is. All right, I'm forwarding it to you now. He's uh, he's not the drug czar. He's like so the homeless czar. Oh, let me get it to you. There you are. You're gonna love this thing, but it's it's he. They think of everything in this one, but I, I, I got a little overwhelmed when I was reading it because it was like so much. I didn't see how you start where you start. All right, so felonies and employment, new drug laws. You know our drug laws are a mess. Wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, the, they are, but you know, again, we keep trying the same thing and expecting a different result. Right, and that's the definition of insanity. Yes, thank you. you no, know, how would you I, how would you structure the laws? Oh, the law, I, I would definitely put education in it. No, no, I mean the the the. Well, I, I understand what you're saying, but but the the upfront laws, like how would, like we have Prop 47, Prop 57. Now it's legal to do drugs, legal to steal drugs, legal to steal to support your habit. It's legal to traffic drugs, which, okay, but there's no there's no stick on the other side for us to use to help get people into treatment. Don't you think? Right, and that's that's what would make it difficult because I'm. I mean, I'm a nurse and I don't know anything about, well, I know some stuff about legal, but not, not in that way. Yeah. But how, how can we get people from that whole incarceration mentality more into the education? I mean, can we, can we put, I mean, we have programs in jail. Well, I was going to say that's one way to do it is to really beef those up, Hello. make them really okay. high quality. So programs in jail we could do. And we should have some sort of way of mandating treatment if, if somebody gets into legal problems. All right. Programs in jail, mandated treatment. Uh, and now, what did you read about my new DA in Los Angeles, uh, Mr. Gascon? It, whether or not, do you think he would be open to these sorts of things? Um, I, looked, I looked on his platform and read some of the stuff. And his, his ideas are okay. And I, I tend to look at things under a microscope, especially when it comes to this, because, again, 
we're we just keep recycling the same old stuff. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, and we can create a bazillion task force to look at everything. But how do you get into the mindset of those people that's actually using? It? I mean, theoretically, yeah, I, I could I could tell you and explain how addiction works on a brain and all that stuff. I could tell you all about neurotransmitters and medications and all that. But and that's what happens. And 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 God bless intellectuals. I mean, I went to school to become one. But just having that knowledge and not actually knowing the experience kind of waters down what you're trying to do. And I was I was looking at his platform and everything sounds great, but there's two things in there I did not see that I think is critical. Tell me. For the homeless population or dealing or going after what he wants to achieve. Go ahead. What are they? Um, vocation and education. Yeah. 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 Anything difficult they seem to leave out. You know, it's, it's hard. You know what I mean? It's hard to get people to do it. It's hard to engage them in it. It's expensive. It's time consuming. And that's what they need. That's what they need. Tell, tell people who maybe haven't, you know, I, I'm looking at the restream and I have a lot of my usuals here watching us, but to give a brief, brief um, sketch of your history with cocaine um, and alcohol. I liked it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I liked it for too many years. Yeah. No, I was uh, in in a nutshell. I come from an abusive background. It was all around my house. That's what I was used to doing. That was my escape. Um, how to deal with or my ineffective coping mechanisms. Unfortunately, I got caught up in that addiction cycle. Um, once it started, um, the thing, um, the reoccurrence of my brain triggered my cravings, and I couldn't stop. Um, I did that for years, became homeless for 23 years. And then suddenly, um, I guess I've been always offered a break, but I never paid attention to it. And then finally, one day, a police officer asked me if I wanted some help. I surrendered, said yes, went to treatment, stuck around there long enough for it to stick and then start practicing a different mindset. And here I am now the director of nursing services. Exactly. Uh, and you were arrested how many times? Oh my God! <laughs> and and so, <laughs> yeah. is is there anything that would have uh, helped you at that point when you were um, in that cycle with the law? Any new law? Or, I, I guess it was all there. They they you finally were list were ready to listen to it. Yeah, the the laws were there. I mean, mind you, I think um, I might. I, I never heard of treatment when I was out there doing what I was doing. I never got introduced uh, to treatment to the. That's end. interesting. You know, that's and interesting. So once I heard about it, I think if somebody would have mentioned treatment in the beginning, I might have went for it. But towards the towards the middle portion, it doesn't matter what you would offer me shorter than drugs. I wouldn't have went for it. I, I just couldn't hear. It. So before we wrap, wrap up, Anthony, I, I want to tackle the problem that never seems to get really thoroughly addressed publicly, which is the intergenerational transmission of trauma which is what you were discussing. You know, you came from an abusive background. Your mother was doing the best she could based on her traumas. How do we deal with this? How do we address it? How do we have a real conversation about it where it, we actually can go at it? Um, first, we have to shine light on it and make it so it's not so abnormal. Because when people look as, you know, a lot of people are in denial about it. A lot of people are embarrassed about it. But it's more common than people believe. Or would know oh, yeah. about it. Oh, well, so, well, not only that, they don't even identify it. Right. They, they call it discipline. They call it normal. <laughs> yeah. 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 Was, we're creating a little social pass by, just by trying to get a kid to go to the, go to the bathroom properly. Yes. You know? That's right. That's right. Um, I think we, we need to shine a light on it. I think that um, we should do sort of like, um, I guess, more investigation without making it seem like we're trying to attack you. Um, kids that come in hospitals, let's look at the family and see what's happening with that. Let, let me ask this. Is there a way we can dovetail in our conversations about racism with racism as its contribution to intergenerational trauma and then go at the intergenerational trauma, something like that? Um, when, when, when you look at racism, and it, it, this seemed to be the hot topic or whatever, um, all of this stuff has been going on forever. This yep. isn't nothing new. Yeah. You know, I was I was born in the 60s. Yeah. You know, the only difference is, is now there's more cameras. Yeah. And so now it's been noticed. Racism has been around forever. Are we going to resolve it anytime soon? I don't think so. You know, 
but but I feel like if we could use it, use the topic to back into other things we seem to have trouble talking about, maybe, you know what I mean? Maybe the sum total will reduce the whole issue or the impact of the issue in some way. You know what I mean? Rather than, I, I, maybe it's silly, but I just keep wondering if there are ways we could use the, the like the same thing when I talk about homelessness. I say, you know, I didn't know that racism is a ruse cause, but look at the outcome. It's got racism clearly plays a role here. And so let's sort of figure out, you know, use that frame to go back in and look at things and look at things we can treat and change. Right. And, and, and that would be fair. If we're going to, if we're going to open up that door and try to educate people on that level, then we're going to have to seriously address it. And as with a lot of things, unfortunately, we tend to lean towards the flavor of the month. It, it sounds good now. We'll put a bunch of money into it right now. But where's the longevity of it? You know, we can open the door. We can look at racism. We can see how it ties into um, a lot of abuse. We can see how people can use substance to deal with some of the inadequate education that people of color aren't able to have access to. We, yeah. we can, that's an easy one to tie into. The question is, how consistent for how long can we keep this going? Right. Well, that's kind. That's kind of why I was hoping to to let it bring us into other topics that maybe we could keep going. You know what I mean? Because they're, because they're so clinical, they, and the clinical world tends to take stuff and look at it therapeutically and sort of stay with it. I, I again, I might be maybe I'm kidding myself, but you know. Hmm. Well, I, I think um, just as we are. Um, coordinating things and working with the homeless, if we address it and stay with it and give it some light and volume, then maybe other people can join on and say, okay, yeah, this is true. Let's investigate that further. Let's add some funding to it and see if there is a correlation. As, as you mentioned, if we can get the scientific community to buy into it, then there you go. Right, right. I, again, I, I think I think to be I, what I'm advocating for is to be broad-minded in the interpretation of what you're looking at because I think that's how you keep the scientific community engaged. Anthony, always a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. The book is Park Avenue, excuse me, Park Bench to Park Avenue. You see his uh, his uh, website, anthonyhowardbrown.com. Before, before I let you go, tell us about Brown Manor. Uh, Brown Manor is doing good. We have, um, that's that's um, that's an abandoned mansion I bought in Ohio, the gift to the homeless people uh, to practice some of the principles that I've learned on how to transition. Right now, we just got done putting a, um, a half a roof on the house. And I say half a roof because the house is 9,000 square foot. Um, I'm doing fundraising for it. I'm selling the book. I'm working two jobs. You know, anything it takes to make this happen, because I think it's important that uh, we live by example. There's no sense of me of saying I want to do something about the homeless population and not do something about the homeless population. Well, and and you're serving them every day in the hospital. I appreciate that. But I And I'm trying to get Anthony engaged in other sorts of um, projects, which will hopefully dovetail over to Brown Manor, raise awareness about Brown Manor. I, I have a feeling some of the stuff I've been getting you involved with, but be sure to bring it up always with any of these people that I send you to, okay, or send to you, okay? Because some of them, because a lot of them will have connections and they'll know people. And I have a feeling you're going to hit a, you're going to find some sort of funding source amongst all these folks that that may really help you. So let's let's just keep keep networking, right? Yes, absolutely. I really appreciate that. All right, my friend. We'll talk again soon. Anthony Brown. Okay, talk. thank you. You betcha. And uh, I'm going to do a little COVID talk with you guys. Uh, Susan, how am I doing on timing? Um, Hope she's going to give that lady a mic. Yeah, like 20 minutes. I have 20 minutes. Okay. So uh, now that a lot of us are, uh, a lot of you are here, uh, donate to Brown Manor. Yes, yes, yes. Anthony is an excellent, Jeremy, outstanding individual. Outstanding individual. Um so I want to thank whomever it was that uh, asked me to watch the Dr. John Campbell interviews. Uh, they've been great. Uh, I I can't say I learned a lot. It, it's more that I would some of my pre-existing hunches were confirmed by him, and that is that's always a great feeling when it calms me down. Is what it does. Like ah, uh, that's what I was thinking. This guy then this guy's a good scientist, and he's got it figured out too. Some of the things that uh, I was interested in, let me just review some of this with you. Um, uh, JH is asking, if you got COVID, would I prescribe ivermectin for you? I can't for you. I prescribed it for Susan if she gets it. We've decided we're going to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm so, not afraid to die. So what he showed, remember I kept saying that an Attitix is going to have a, a score that we're going to be able to give everyone in the new year. 
Well, I'm going to take, I'm going to, in December, I'm going to be taking an Aditix, um, uh, oh shoot, what do they call it? Anyway, it's an immune spectrum analysis, essentially. The Aditix Core, they call it. And they're going to, I, I just talked to somebody who had it done, and it showed exactly what Dr. Campbell was talking about. He had T cell immunity to coronavirus, even though he had never had SARS coronavirus 2. He'd never had COVID-19. It looks like, and Dr. Campbell was confirming this, that other antecedent COVID or coronavirus exposures can confer some significant immunity to this coronavirus in certain individuals. You know how sometimes we say, well, there might be a genetic factor or something. Now we're able to dial that in immunologically. Okay, so A, we'll be able to see if you had that uh, if you have that immunity. So I'm going to get myself tested in December, so I'll let you know on that. Number two, we're going to be talking more meaningfully about how to enhance immune function. And again, Dr. Campbell went to that in a, in a lot of good detail. Uh, particularly, he was saying that zinc uh, both increases IL-6, I'm sorry, decreases IL-6, which is one of the mediators of the cytokine storm, and it decreases the ACE2 inset receptors, which are what the coronavirus gets in with. It uses those receptors to get into our body. And that was interesting to me. And zinc is, has directly antiviral. And he reviewed all the data on low zinc levels having bad outcomes with, with uh, pneumonia and COVID. So that was also very interesting to see that all reviewed in one place. Um, yes, Shannon, uh, the, in addition to that, vitamin D and vitamin C, very important, um, immune modulating. He also has videos on that. And he just does a nice job of reviewing what's out there. So if anyone uh, else is interested, is Dr. John Campbell. Uh, in terms of the data that's going on here, I'm going to pull some of it up right now. Uh, LA, we're not doing as well as we had been doing, but we're not doing badly by any means. Uh, Orange County, they're sort of bouncing around a little bit, but again, not bad. California generally has been doing very, very well. I mean, the numbers are sort of uh, good. So here's the overall data for the country I'm looking at. And the hospitalization rate has really begun to kind of accelerate, I would say. Um, it's nowhere near as high as it was in July, where it was topped out at about 60,000. But it may, it may exceed that, right? It may go higher than the 60,000, uh, just judging by the, the slope on the graph of the cases. A lot of cases are coming on board now. But the hospitalization rate is still relatively low relative to the previous surges. And remember, doctors are encouraging people into the hospital now to get all those good treatments we have. So it's not discouraging hospitalization, incurring during hospitalization, but we'll see how what that actually means in the long run. Interestingly, as I went state to state, Kelly Gallagher, I'm glad you're taking zinc, 25 milligrams, elemental zinc. As long as you're going state to state, what, what I found interesting was as soon as the uh, case rate went up, the hospitalization went up right away. There was no lag, which is interesting. That's a new thing, and I think that's reflective of the physician behavior. Interestingly, although the hospitalization rate went up quickly with the case rate, death rate remained generally kind of flat. So that's encouraging. And so when you look at the death rate here uh, on the overall graph, Susan, you want to put up the um, COVID tracking project maybe? I can try. Yeah, let's see. Because you'll, you'll see more exactly what I'm talking about. And we'll, we'll go through some of the states. All right, give me a minute. Okay. All right, we'll get you a chance to get up there. You didn't give me a I, I didn't. Up. I just thought of it, and I apologize for I that. Um, let me... Let me go through some of your guys' questions here, as long as I've got a second to talk to you guys. Uh, well, we have a great show on Monday. Yes, we have the Kreischers, Bert and Leanne Kreischer, coming in here Monday. Oh, that is a classic look on Leanne's face. You see it. Uh, you see it in every phone call uh, on the cabin on Netflix. If you watch that new series that uh, Bert did, uh, I ran into Bert a couple of days ago, and he's. We're all worried about his health. So we'll end up talking about Bert's health, no doubt, when he comes on <laughs> in here. He is, uh, I'm going to do an immune profile on him. That would be interesting. Okay, I'll uh, find a stupid COVID tracker. Okay, COVID tracker. And look at the, just the, our data, just the U.S. data. Yeah, make sure Bert wears a shirt. I don't think. Uh, <laughs> I'm pants. Uh, Mad Lib, uh, Passy <laughs> Recovery Center was never my hospital. I never actually worked there. I just used it. Uh, I brought my team there to do that television series. I worked at a place called Las Encinas Hospital. Bob and Shelly did uh, end up working at uh, Passy Recovery Center a little bit. Um, I believe it's closed now. 
Bert not wearing a shirt. How disgusting. He walks around all the time without a shirt. <laughs> and he is partying too much, so but he can't seem to funny, stop. Yeah. But he's got an anxiety disorder and OCD and all kinds of other stuff. Oh, uh, what's this now? Australia is scared. Have you watched their media? They say China will come after them and Biden will let them. We need Trump for our world leaders to be strong. I'm not aware of that. So what are um, we looking at? Samantha, you do not need to keep wiping down groceries. It is an airborne viral uh, respiratory virus. It does not appear to be significant. Mean, washing hands is always a good idea. Flu is around, but rinsing down the groceries and all the crazy things we were doing in the early part of the spring turns out not to be necessary. Yeah, uh, I remember when they said humidifiers. Yeah, humidifiers. Not Again, not a bad idea, but not something that really makes a difference. Okay, so I've got the... Uh uh, Monica Riki asked a great question. Do I think COVID will enable Americans to receive telemedicine services? The answer to that is yes, and that is that has been one of the major advances. They've loosened the laws around us going across state lines, and generally, pharmacists will allow prescribing across state lines too. We're gonna have a we're gonna have some this vet project in tomorrow that does uh, telemedicine. Is yeah, we're doing something very different tomorrow, which is a, a veterinary telemedicine. Susan we'll said she, she would want that, so she wanted to know more about. It. She figured other people would and, want that yeah, as well. Yeah, and Dr. Kelly Victory, who has horses and dogs. Oh, and so we're going to bring Kelly be... Victory in to do a little COVID and then a lot of vet. Well, or maybe just doggies. We're going to talk about dogs, cats, and and uh, horses. Horses. So here's the. Uh, All right, here's the COVID tracking project. All right, so. If you look at the blue in the lower left-hand corner, you don't have to move anything, Susan. It's all perfect. Yes, having that, that cursor there is I nice. I know. Am I getting good at this or what? Yeah, you are. But notice if you go to the right of the blue, to that uh, the death, new deaths there, there, look how high that is in spite of the hospitalization rate being the same in July and how much lower the death rate is in July in spite of the same number of hospitalizations. And now accelerating hospitalizations, if you go back July. to the blue, go back to the blue, what, go to the current day. Go to the right. Yeah, see what that number is. We're at 53,000 hospitalizations. So we're almost at the 60,000 peak. And look at the death rate. Now, it's a lagging indicator. It may stay. It may pop up. And there was a weird pop-up yesterday that apparently was a dumping. That was a statistical thing. It's not it's a like big a deal. Thousand. That was yesterday. But yeah, around 900. We're around 900. And, and there we have stayed. It's a lot of people. I don't want to minimize the, the fact that it's a lot of people. But yeah. I, I don't think we're going to see a spike up again like we had in May, which would be a very good thing. It's in spite of a lot more cases. And we'll see if it's more hospitalizations or not. So it's, uh, again, as I said before, the virus will decide where it goes. Put up Wisconsin, if you could, Susan. And I'm going to show you how, how some of these um, states are going. There you go. W-I. Here I know. It comes. I'm getting good at this. Look at that. Look at you. Ta -da. Okay. Good data collection. A+. Plus. I know I, I'm finally figuring this out. So it's COVID will be over and I'll get really good at uh, it. So look at the, so go to the full, full. Oh, uh, full range. Yeah. Full range. Blink. Okay. So as you see, they've never had an outbreak. The surge is now. If you go to the right upper corner, you have the pink, right? They've never had anything until now they've got it. Now they're in with the rest of us. What happened to Wisconsin? Well, they had, they had some gatherings. They had people gathering in large numbers. They and were that's doing a, great. They decided I, it was if a people hoax. get if, it, <laughs> if people gather in long numbers, large numbers, there until is like September, like that's, but and it, you know what? My astrologist said that that was, that's sort of a date, like a weird uh, Mars in retrograde time September when people just go crazy and do whatever they want and boom look wisconsin right. was in well, there there it is they were in retro so look at the blue in the bottom <laughs> uh the blue at the bottom yeah okay so you see how right when right in the first week of september when the outbreak began the hospitalizations went up immediately now what do you mean when the outbreak began this surge began about september 1st look at the red the red upper corner right but what happened in september 1st I, I don't know. The, the outbreak started. Kids I, went back to school. Outbreak started. Whatever. Maybe I, that, kids went back to school. Oh, well, there was a lot of university spread. There was a lot of spread at universities and things. Wisconsin that, has a big college. It does. That's right? right. That's correct. So I don't. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know. I wasn't watching I mean, it. I wasn't predicting it. But let me let me finish my point. Please let me finish my point. Okay. On the lower right hand corner, this is what's problematic about Wisconsin. This is why I picked Wisconsin. Look how the death rate went up in Wisconsin. So they never had their surge. So in states that didn't have a surge, it looks like it may be hitting a different population. Now, the numbers are nowhere near what they are seeing in California. 58 deaths. Yeah, it's 58, but it's a lot more from where they were. And it went up with the surge. So I'm wondering is if in these states that never had a surge and are now having a surge. Aren't, weren't prepared. 
No, is it the reason the death rate is going up in those states is the the vulnerable are getting it. Yeah. And in other states, the vulnerable have already gotten it mm -hmm. or are being properly protected. And states that have not had the surge yet, for whatever reason, they're not taking the necessary precautions. Yeah. It's just part of how the virus behaves. You're seeing this. Now, go to Ohio. Oh, God, go to Ohio, for thing. instance. Where do you find the jump to a state? Right just here. go down. There you are. No, you just jumped. To You're a state. better than I am. Look at I that. I know. I'm getting really good at this. Karen's went wild in September, as Shinkadello says. <laughs> Uh, Packer fans had a family reunion. It was half the state. Jeremy, very interesting. Maybe. Okay, so go to the full range here. Oh. <clears throat> Is that the full range? Yeah. yeah. So look at Ohio. Ohio's had three, two little things, and then all of a sudden, a boom. But but even though they're they've people. broken out of their pattern, the death rate didn't go up with it, right? Right. So as though the the vulnerable got got it in that first surge or something i i don't know i'm trying to figure this out maybe they have or it's mostly in ohio. Mm, maybe or ohio ohio has a lot of universities and maybe there's a lot of students so maybe yeah, it's a lot of young are. people getting it um let Seems me like the states with the big football universities are. let's go to massachusetts if you don't mind again I've, I've been fishing around in all these webs on all these states trying to figure this out and look at massachusetts give me the full range on it too Okay, so now they're having an outbreak, no increase in death rate. Look at that. This is their this is their second go around. So it yeah, almost looks like Massachusetts doesn't have any big schools. <laughs> yeah, but but what it looks like? Well, they do. They have UMass. They have, right? Massachusetts has more schools per unit uh, square unit mile than any other. State yeah, but in the like country. UMass isn't near Amherst, and it's like just such a small community. It wouldn't be like a city. Boston University. Boston College, yeah, that part. Was University of uh, Massachusetts, Boston, Harvard, Are they MIT. Open? Have they yes, been open? Yes, things were opening. Okay. Yeah. So, so, but this this is another version, and this version looks a little bit like New York. Now, if you better, go to New York, hospitals. Go to New York. You see, <laughs> then the death rate is not get going up that Big bad. Big cities have better hospitals. No. Well, they had such a huge surge in the beginning. They're the ones that had the huge surge in the beginning are having a little problem right now. See, it looks like they're having a little something going on, and it's and it's there's kind of a death rate fall, but then it's from at such a low level. It's from five to fifteen in a city in a state that size. It's hard to make. Look at that. Doesn't that, that red particularly look like Massachusetts? Yeah, if you don't, if you look at the Kinda last wild. ninety days, it looks bad, right? Well, you, you got to you you look at the full range. Yeah, but you also if you, and go to the ninety days again. Okay. You have to look at the numbers. You're going from five. They were at five deaths a day. They were way down. They've yeah. gone up to fifteen. You know, the hospitalization rate is going up, and it's going up again right alongside of the the case rate, which is new. That's a new thing. It's not a lagging indicator to oh, hospitalization this is York, rate. Right? Okay. Yeah. So it's weird. Well it, they they my son flew to New York today and they they he was he filled out a form and said he was going into New York City and they said he had to get a COVID test tomorrow and then he had to get one in three days and then the fourth day he could go out. And I'm like, well if you caught COVID, he's been quarantined. If you caught COVID, why would you get a test the first day? Why right, don't you just get it the third day? I know. Because I, insanity, I mean they're wasting the money. They're yes, wasting they his insurance money. I'm like, yep. you're not gonna know you're gonna have you have COVID from a plane the same day. Like, do you catch it that fast? Would you know? So Justin, you no, say No, Drew, tell me. Can you would you know like tomorrow? Will Jordan know if he has COVID tomorrow? If, or is it just if he's to prove tested he, tomorrow? Yeah. He could. He could? He I mean, could get it, it on the plane and have it by tomorrow. And no, it but he could. Have, what they want to know is if they have somebody amongst them that has it. You know what I mean? He, they want to make sure that they're documenting the presence of the virus before people become symptomatic. That's that's the that's the game. It's all right. Yeah, I know. It's, it's not bad. It, the I weird totally thing is if they do it after keep, three days. Yeah. Like, it's just, don't waste your money and time. I agree. So um, He's just going to be in the apartment anyways. Justin working. says, we have two ICU beds uh, where I live. What, read the data very carefully. More often than not, they haven't opened all the ICU beds. It's a percentage of beds that are staffed. It's a staffing issue. They usually can't find enough staff to cover all the beds. And so the percentage of beds open tends to be very small. And look at what percentage of the ICU beds are actual COVID cases. It tends to be very small. Every time I've heard doomsday predictions about ICU beds, I dug into the data and the data shows no, that it's a staffing issue. There are more beds. They will staff up if they need it. And most of the cases are non-COVID. So just look, look very, very, very carefully. Yes, Tom Cigar, I'm trying to fight the panic point. What was he? Oh, there was another panic point thing came out yesterday. 
Oh, God. Which was, which was the American Academy of Pediatrics put out this data going 66,000 kids have COVID. Ah. Then I read the study and it's like, oh, they're talking about zero to 19. So all the kids that got sick were teenagers. None of the children got sick. And everybody who got sick had pre-existing conditions. So it, and the, it turns out that the hospitalization rate for pediatric cases at risk, meaning with pre-existing condition, was 1% of all COVID hospitalizations, 1%. And the death was like 0.04% of all COVID deaths. So it's like they're not getting sick. They're not dying. They're doing really well. Yes, it's a lot of kids. And yes, we should be aware of that. The, if you're an at-risk child, should be very careful, just like an at-risk adult. But the panic porn was just ridiculous. Look, look ridiculous. Okay. Jordan's texting me because he wants to know what a broiler is. A boiler is a thing where that's the hot water heater, isn't it? Or the heater is just sometimes just the heaters. Why is there something wrong with the boilers in his room? No, he doesn't know what a broiler is. Broiler. Because he, he got some steak. Broiler. Okay, they said boiler. Like He's making been... steak in an apartment in New York and... He's texting me. He goes, do you have anything other than Himalayan pink salt? <laughs> like, yes. There's, and it's like he called. He just called me. He him misses on. you. That's all. I know. He's he, he's, he's been used to living at home. <laughs> it's a good thing he got he out. He cooks all our food. It's a good thing he got we out we out have here. to do our own cooking tonight. It's going to be terrible. Well, uh, Tom Cigar, that's a very high praise. I thank you for that. We're going to uh, make steaks and, tonight. And by without the way, it's him. not my streams that are that are pushing back on the panic porn. It's my encouragement for you to look for yourself, and that reduces the panic porn when you really when you don't take the headline at face value. All right, Susan, I think I've done my thing. Uh, is there anything I think he else? He does miss me. <laughs> anything else you guys? Like Our to talk boys about? are so sweet. Like. Except for, you know, when they found out we had fleas. That was a bummer. I had to get rid of the fleas today. Yeah. But I handled it. I think we're flea free. Rogan so, said today, hold on a second. Baby fleas. Uh, he'd vote for Joe Jorgensen in California. Not a big waste. It'd only matter in a swing state. Yeah. That, then Joe Jorgensen was the, uh, was the libertarian. Yeah. Um, I think wait, I might somebody, go libertarian next time, uh, too. Uh, put can you put Florida up there? Somebody's asking for Florida and the COVID tracking. You got it. Because COVID, Florida is completely open. Now uh, is that Florida? No, it's New York. Mm -hmm. Let me get Florida. And give me first the overall, the big picture, the full picture. Okay. Yes, boss. Thank you. Okay, so you see, again, a little bit like California, a little bit like New York. Death rate, de death rate is going down in spite of hospitalization rate going up. Case rate going up, but hospitalization rate following, but not at a high clip. So in spite of the case being, the, the place being open, the state is completely open. It looks just about like most of the other states. So no, now it's going down. Deaths are the going down. The deaths are going down, but it may go up. But put California in there, because California is oh, the one that is the most gone. like this. Can you put California in There's there? There's a lot of old people in Florida, too. California, yes, there are, which is kind of interesting that it's not worse there. I thought it would be just terrible. But somehow they keep them alive there. Okay. This okay, is, is that California? California? Okay, so look at that death rate in look California. God bless We were told California. by our state health officials that on sep but September 15th that he guaranteed a 90% increase in hospitalization in, th in, a, in a month. Guaranteed. Now look at that. It's down, down, down. Not only is hospitalization down, death rate is down. And death rate is continuing down. Can you just click on the death rate thing? Because because California has a really good new deaths. Yeah, just that graph. Can you it's can you isolate 16. it or enlarge it? Um, because that to me, oh, I can try. Um, yeah. As critical as I am of uh, the, how the California government has handled this, this is something for them to take a bow for. Because that this that graph, and can you do it? Mm, Oops, sorry. Can you do it for the last ninety days? Shoot, where'd it go? It's up. It went away. It's up. Oh, there it there is. There it is. Oh, can I'm we do sorry. the last ninety days? Yes, doll. Thank you. I'm trying. I'm oh, you're trying doing great. To get it. There it is again. But we look at the last ninety days. It's this is so, ninety days. No, oh, no, this is that's May. the whole thing. Um, it's back super up. impressive. Up super impressive. Boop, boop, boop. So and yeah, and you know, you're California, flying from California to New York. They shouldn't be giving you so, shit about so, so go up, go up back to hospitalization if you don't mind. Okay, that has stayed flat. Look, it's going up a little bit, but it stayed flat. And they guaranteed a ninety percent increase in the middle of September. Look, yeah. please. <laughs> they, how about how I about mean, you congratulate the population people. of California for doing a good people. job as opposed to threatening them with more closures? Yeah, then go down to deaths. But there's a lot of people. And look at that. That is a steady decline down to. I mean, some days we. Here? 
I don't know what we're doing, but we're I, that's the one thing as critical as I am of the consequences of what they've done. There is something that they should take about. You know, for. though the weather has been extremely warm here. That's for true. A, the whole time. It, that's true. I mean, today it's like eighty-five. But in New York, it's 70 this whole week. It's going to be 70 when yep. Jordan's there, and he's going to be cooped up in our house. Well, we'll see. So see him get him out of there. Stupid. Okay. He goes, he said, he's so, they're all. Yes. Uh, Andrew Ashkazvili said, I think we've learned to treat people if they make it into a doctor's office before they get put on a vent. I think we know we've, tr Andrew, we're doing a lot of things. We're doing ivermectin. We're doing hydroxychloroquine. We're doing doxycycline, azithromycin. We're doing steroids. We're doing. When they get sick, we're putting them in prone position. We're not putting them on a ventilator until their their O2 sats goes way down into the 70s. We are not. Uh, we're giving them convalescent plasma. We're using Regeneron. We're using uh, Remdesivir. Maybe we're using some of the fancier stuff like Lorolimab. But it's having a significant effect on our ability to make this a less fatal illness. And the less fatal it is, the more of a flu it is. And so I, I, I think there's a lot of things to feel very good about here in spite of the fact that we are having an outbreak. We are really having an outbreak. And I think the reason um, they, the press can't quite get it to stick, they're trying to induce the panic porn again. They're trying to stir everybody up. They can't get it to stick, mostly because they're so preoccupied with the election. So we'll see if it comes back again when the uh, election is over. So What? Um, well, I don't come back. Sorry, I was texting Jordan. Um, that the panic porn will come back so oh it's gonna be so much different it's gonna be like hearts and flowers okay so it's already hearts and flowers the last 24 hours i've been like for some reason the news doesn't pop up on my phone for some reason it's like maybe they're not even writing anything surprisingly the stock market isn't completely tanking mm -hmm. after usually when a democrat comes in office it just goes Phew. Maybe all right. Yeah. All right. Well, listen. I'm going to wrap things up. I got some other stuff I got to take care of here. Let me uh, see your guys' last comments here. Uh, uh, yeah, I saw it, was, it was a mellow day. There's a football game coming. You know, we got pre we got preempted by the. What did the president, the president say? By the way, did you guys get a chance? Because I heard lots of people getting somebody upset on about your that. Twitter said, "Tom Segura, why don't you take the tape of the president's speech and make Drew." analyze it on after dark yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Referring to i used to it, do that i used to do that on john on don lemon's show yeah and that's what happened uh, and then it, i started that then, gets you in trouble though well then i analyzed what hillary's doctors said about her metal medical care and, and you that was no you can't CNN. do that you can't do that so you were you so. were excommunicated it's weird i did a, 10 minutes on the, trump's behavior and 30 seconds on you hillary's were medical censored record. for a year mm -hmm. That was interesting. Yes, you, it, you're still censored over there. They don't want to have anything to do with you. How dare you, Dr. Lamictal Dan? causes mania, Stephanie? No, Lamictal is an excellent treatment for mania. It does not cause mania. Guaranteed. Uh, I want to read this guy's... Kelly Gallagher. Uh, Dane. Dane Franzen. Dane Franzen, are you out there? He said, Tom Segura, can you guys play the Trump speech, Dr. Drew, on the next podcast? I'd love to hear his professional diagnosis. That's hysterical. And then watch our entire Okay, people are starting to watch the football game now. Who's so. playing? 49ers, evidently, because people are cheering. Boop, boop. Uh, so we will yeah, go watch Yeah, let's go watch football. Thursday I'm in the football. mood. We're yep. going to make steak and make football. Right, watch football. That sounds like a plan. And then don't forget to tune in on Monday. We'll be here um, tomorrow with uh, Dr. Kelly and the, the vet guys. And then we're going to talk about your animals. Yeah. And then, and instead of COVID nineteen, and then we're also going to have. I don't have the banner for that yet, but um, we also have the amazing Bert Kreischer and Leanne Kreischer and Leanne, his beautiful wife, who is also on his show and very funny. Oh my God, she's the she's the winner in uh, the cabin. Uh, GSR, the death rate in California: fourteen deaths on the third, sixty three on the fifth uh 66 on the fourth so we're, we're generally and we're down from our high peak was 220 deaths a day going. so we are way down and and and, can, and with a strictly negative slope so tomorrow's to show is at 2 p.m pacific if anybody's around um we'll check out the twitter and the instagram and the facebook you'll be able to see the time but it'll be at two o'clock pacific because drew booked himself all afternoon all right, and uh, I will uh, see you all tomorrow. 
And don't forget to support our sponsors. Yes, please. Please do. They're, they're, we, have, we have really great sponsors. See Blue Microphone. I'm next to the Blue Microphone. We are proud and happy to have these people on board with us. We're carefully selecting. And them. we're happy to pay 71% tax on every dime we make. So there, well, thankfully we can pay employees here and the, and the bills <laughs> I can to write it up. this thing. Somebody yeah. else can pay 71%. Yeah. We, I don't know could, if we're going to hit 71% say, this year. <laughs> right. I was going to say, if we could get enough where we get taxed, that would be nice. So. I, don't think we have, right. I think we're going to have to like, like, I don't know. We're going to, we'll see. We're going to have to sell right. the house. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. We're gradually moving back to opening schools and businesses. And of course our in-person interactions. I want to remind you, this is all time with cold and flu season getting going. Staying hydrated is key to helping your body deal with the added stress and with the upcoming flu season. My regular fans have heard me talk about a product called Hydrite for a long time now. It's an amazing rapid rehydration drink. It's a mix that, well, we're obsessed with here. I'm excited to announce they've just released Hydrolyte Plus Immunity just in time for cold and flu season. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of immune-boosting ingredients. Each single-serve, easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 300 milligrams of elderberry extract, creates what is hopefully immune-boosting formula that's high in antioxidants and zinc. Combining this with Hydrolyte's seven key electrolytes, it's a fantastic way to stay proactive and properly hydrated. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour powder sticks that rapidly dissolve in water and make a great tasting drink that has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all natural flavors and it is gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and it is vegan. And you can find Hydrolyte Plus by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that's H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-W. And be sure to use our code Dr. Drew 25 at checkout for a special discount.